Remember we're looking historically at the Apocrypha. We're going to work our way from the time of the New Testament all the way up until, well, up until modern times, up until, uh, well, last century and see what the British and American Foreign Bible Societies uh, had to do with the Apocrypha eventually. And, uh, through the Reformation, what was done during the time of Calvin and Luther. Hallelujah. Our basic concern in, in studying this right now, uh, we had to come to some technical understanding of some things here recently, concerns the Roman Catholic Church. That's because the Roman Catholic Church, you'll read in their writings all the time, they're making different claims as to who among the church writers approved of canonical status being given to various of the apocryphal books. And we've already cleared up the issue of the New Testament question, which really takes a lot away from the Roman Catholic position because the most important church writers are the New Testament authors. And so if you take that away from them, which we have done in the last two weeks in looking at the alleged use of the Apocrypha in the New Testament, then it doesn't leave them a lot to stand on except the writings of church fathers. It's going to be very detailed. It'll be a little like what we did in canonicity where we had to give you various names of church fathers and what their opinion was about what books were included in the Old Testament, what books were included in the New. But I think it's very important because, well, people try to trip you up. We'd like the whole world to be honest. We'd like religious leaders to be honest, but many times they aren't. And they'll try to trip you up by saying, well, such and such early church leader quotes from this as being scriptural. This is canonical as far as he is concerned. Mm -hmm. And we need to come to an understanding of that because yeah. uh, what about some of these early writers? Famous, famous writers, starting with Clement all the way up until the time of Augustine, famous writers making allusions to the Apocrypha, references there found in their writings. So I guess we can begin by saying this, which we already know in this church, that the early church writers, if they are any later than the earliest of them and the earliest of the New Testament authors, don't hold as much authority in any area about anything, as far as we're concerned, if it disagrees with the writings of the New Testament. Those are the earliest church writers are the men who penned the New Testament. Some wrote historically, those who came afterwards, and some wrote by divine authority, namely the New Testament authors. So if there is any contradiction between the two, then we're going to have to opt for the former. That the New Testament authors, what they give us, and of course they are tracing their teaching back to Jesus, and Jesus didn't come on the scene in a vacuum where nothing was going on or nothing was happening or no one had any idea about canon, uh, canonicity or the canonical status of Old Testament books. And so he just said, I think this is what we'll do, men. We'll let it be the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's what will make scripture. No, the Jews had already come to agreement about that from the day, from the very day that every single Old Testament book was written. Yeah. When it was written, we trace that from canonicity way back to the beginning. Whenever Moses wrote a copy of the law, he said, now you put this by the side of the Ark of the Covenant. That's how important this is. It didn't go through a period of time until finally, by the time we get to Ezekiel and some of the latter prophets, then finally they say, I think that guy Moses had a, a good point or two about the laws of God, which is what the school of higher criticism says. It took a long time. And it was the antiquity of the books that gave them their authority. And we don't believe that. It was the Holy Spirit that gave the books their authority. Antiquity didn't do anything except sometimes make the men turn their backs on the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's all time will do. Not make you love the Word of God more, but like the Word of God less. Amen. That's what invariably happens. So having dealt with the New Testament, we're going to start our study tonight through history of the negative and positive things said about the in the inclusion of the Apocrypha with three Jewish sources and then we'll work our way through about a dozen or more Christian sources. Let's begin with Philo, the Alexandrian Jewish historian. I'm going to try to give you dates on all of these men, but they're very general. In other words, I won't give you March the 5th of 40 AD, we'll just say AD 40. 
which is the date for Philo, A.D. 40? A little bit of this is review from canonicity, and some of this, I hope, as your ears hear this, they will be attuned to it because you've heard it before. Philo speaks of the threefold division of the Old Testament canon among the Jews, and he speaks of that threefold division as follows. The law and oracles uttered by the prophets, divisions one and two and three, and hymns and the others by which knowledge and piety are increased and perfected. Does that sound familiar? The law and oracles uttered by the prophets and hymns and the others. <coughs> others might have reference to something like maybe Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. By which knowledge and piety are increased and perfected. Which of necessity excludes the Apocrypha? because the Apocrypha was never considered to be part of the law, never oracles uttered by the prophets, never hymns or others, as the Jews understood them of that day. Remember that some of these writers, we've got various avenues that we can pursue in trying to determine what their opinion was about canonical books or what their opinion was about Apocryphal books. Uh, let me just go over this briefly. It comes to mind so you'll understand how we come to understanding of some of these things. For instance, one avenue that can be pursued is rarely, and it doesn't come until later on, do we have someone who actually gives us a list of the books felt to be canonical. In other words, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, all the way to Second Chronicles, all the way to Malachi or whatever. That's one way we can determine, in other words, what their opinion is concerning the canonical status of the book or the lack thereof. Do they give, is that book that we are discussing, is that book in their stated list of 22 books or 24 books or 39 books or 44 books or 66 books or whatever type of list they have? Then do they name that? Another way, they'll give us the divisions like we've just looked in Philo, law, oracles of the prophets, hymns, and others, without telling us how many total or how many in each division. In other words, this is not uh, as entirely safe, we could say, as would be the case where they just list them 1 through 22. Another way, kind of an offshoot of that, they could give us the three divisions or however many they feel to be appropriate, and the number of books, no names, or that'd just be a long listing like the first point I gave you, but the number of books, as we'll get in the second case with Josephus here momentarily. Or another way, I think we're about on number four, would be quotations from the books. If they're saying, as said Isaiah the prophet or as says the scriptures, and then they give us Isaiah 1.10, and that's quoted, and it's quoted after the citation formula, as says the scripture. Then we know what he believes about Isaiah. He believes the book of Isaiah, or at least Isaiah 1 and verse 10, to be scripture. And then one final way would be allusions. He just, you know, for instance, talked about uh, the suffering servant then he's not quoting Isaiah 53 or the end of Isaiah 52, but if he made allusion, he wouldn't have to use that terminology. That's really modern terminology in theological circles to speak of the identification of the suffering servant. But if he talked about one who was bruised by the Lord, who was smitten and stricken by the Lord, we know what he's talking about, Isaiah 53, or someone who had their hair pulled and their beard plucked off and they were smitten in the face. We know he's talking about Isaiah 52 there. So there's an illusion. It's not a quotation, as says Isaiah the prophet. There's an illusion. So, as far as I'm concerned, I know somewhat of his belief in the area of Isaiah 52 or Isaiah 53. So you have to fit these various uh, writers that we'll give you under these various categories.
Philo obviously fits into the one of just giving us the names of three divisions, but he doesn't tell us what the books are. We would like to have that, although I think we know, I think we've already proven before, what Philo had in the back of his mind when he gave this threefold division, or how many books total would be found there. Okay, do you all understand that? We've covered much of that before. <coughs> Philo quotes from all of the Old Testament books except the following. Ecclesiastes, the song, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Esther. He also omits quotations and allusions to some of the minor prophets. But since evidently at that time the minor prophets were not twelve but one, it was considered one book, then to quote from one of them is to quote from the book that contained the twelve. Because in most of these cases where we count up numerically how many books we have in the whole list or how many books we have in the certain divisions of the list, then invariably minor prophets are not twelve, but minor prophets is one. Now for us today we think of minor prophets, there were twelve minor prophets, but it's counted as one book, just like the Megillah or the Roar was counted as one book, although it had five on it. Okay, in the second place, that's Philo in the second place, and I'm going to say something else about Philo when we get to another point here in a moment that maybe you didn't know about him. That'll go back and prove, really prove something we've discussed before about the so-called two-canon theory. The second place, Josephus, another Jewish historian. But Josephus was from Palestine. Philo was from Egypt. Josephus was from Palestine, although I believe he ended up over in Italy later on after the conquest of Jerusalem and the city and, the, well, the whole nation in AD 70. Then he was allowed to go somewhere else. We'll date his writings around A.D. 90. Josephus writes in Against Appion, Book 1, Paragraph 8, that there were 22 books in the Old Testament. So he gives us a total number, and more than that, he gives us a breakdown of five 13 and 4. And he refers to these books as follows. The law, that would have to be 5. The prophets, that would have to be 13. And hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. That would have to be 4. The law, the prophets, and hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. Okay, I think we all know the law from Genesis through Deuteronomy. Before doing the middle one, let's go to the last division. We have to come to some understanding of what Josephus is talking about. This does give us our... 22 total, 5, 13, and 4. The only way we can hope to come to some idea of what four books he had in mind is how does he describe them? He describes them as hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. Well, what four books do you think would fit there? What four books sound like they fit there from the Old Testament that obviously wouldn't be law and obviously in this category, in this division, wouldn't be prophets, what would be, number one, hymns. What would be a hymn? Psalms. And what else? We have any hymns. A song. The song. Okay, there are two songs there, two hymns. The, the psalms were considered to be hymns. The song of, of Solomon was just that, a song. Then what about something to help us about the affairs of human life? Proverbs. Ecclesiastes teaches you this is what to do in life, this is what not to do. Let me tell you, I've had experience firsthand. This is what not to do in life, this is what to do in life. Okay, that takes care of nine books. Now we need 13 more. What do we have as far as the prophets are concerned? Do them in the English order. English order. Joshua, Joshua Judges, and he evidently included 
Ruth with Judges. Why? Because in the days of the Judges, according to Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, this book came about. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, both of those together. We've broken them up. They were one book, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. Now see, Chronicles is different now when we get to a later division. Chronicles ends up in another category entirely. But here among the prophets. What's that? Five? We've got to get 13. Chronicles? What's after Chronicles? Ezra and Nehemiah, always considered as one book because the two men went together. Esther. Now that's interesting. According to Josephus, Esther was written by a prophet. That was one of our interesting things we discovered whenever we discussed this in canonicity earlier. As we, as we were able to prove from like uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 19 and 20, all the Old Testament books were written by prophets because those men were prophets. Okay, we're up through uh, Esther, Job. That was written by a prophet, so we know that Job's a prophet. Well, James 5 tells us that Job was a prophet. Okay, someone says Isaiah, Jeremiah, and include Lamentations with that. Ezekiel, that's 11. Daniel, Daniel is among the prophets. Not later on, but there he's among the prophets. And the 12, the 12 and there's our 13 books. So once we can do that, work our way through that, that tells us right away what Josephus thought about the Apocrypha. It's not included. It doesn't fit in the law. It doesn't fit in hymns or precepts for the conduct of human life. And it doesn't fit among the 13. We just counted those up, and that's why we took the time to do it. So Josephus lets us know what he thinks about the Apocrypha. Now, <laughs> you see, my question always is, uh, who are we going to believe, the modernist scholar of the 20th century or Josephus, who was a Jew who lived in, who ought to know what he's talking about, <laughs> who doesn't have anything to prove one way or the other? I mean, he's not thinking, okay, school of higher criticism. How can I trip people up? <laughs> Just, we're Jews. We don't believe in the Apocrypha. I mean, come on, we don't believe in the Apocrypha. We have the books that were accepted by Ezra, Nehemiah, the people during that time of our history. And what came after that is just that, books that came after the spirit of prophetism was lifted and taken out of the nation of Israel. So who are we going to believe? We're going to, I'm going to believe Josephus, what he had to say. As long as we can tell he's not trying to prove something that's false just for sake of argument for some ludicrous, ridiculous point that he has in the back of his mind, which is about how it happens today, and that's really not stretching the issue. Josephus quotes from all of the Old Testament books except the following. Job, Ecclesiastes, the Song, and Proverbs. So that's one of the prophet books from the 13, and that would be three out of the hymns and precepts section. One of the hymns, the song, and two from the precepts, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So in other words, what I'm saying by that is in these three divisions, he quotes from at least one book from that division. All of the law, all but one, of the books in the prophets, all except Job, and only one out of four, and that would be the book of Psalms, which would obviously be the book from which you would quote in this third division of hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. He omits references to Ecclesiastes, the Song, and Proverbs, but he does include the book of Psalms. Now, I don't really want to go too far back into history, uh, history in our class and history just in history to the time of Josephus, but uh, remember a lot of scholars, it seems like, um, even Green, I've got one of Green's book here, books here I want to give you a quote from concerning Augustine later on, uh, says, and several people have followed this recently in the last century, that Josephus, when he gave us this 5.13.4, instead of the standard, what they call the standard division of the Talmud, which is going to come 300 years later, he deviates from the contemporary, normally accepted pattern of division during the first century. But we have to say, how can you say that upon what ev evidence is that set? How do you know that Josephus is departing from what was customary during the first century? 
We don't feel that he was departing. We feel that was the customary division. The Talmud picks up a different division later on because we have other books added in. So a lot of that we've already covered before. Then in the third place, still under Jewish authorities, we have the quote-unquote Council of Jamnia that's shrouded in mysticism in the past. We don't know whether it ever happened, but if you're going to pick that it did or that it didn't, I guess with the evidence it should be safe as to say that it did. Same date, A.D. 90. Now, you should all be thoroughly familiar with what goes on at Council of Jamnia, so I won't bore you with those statistics again. Just suffice to say in a sentence or so that important discussions were held in the Council of Jamnia concerning five Old Testament books. You remember which five those were? We've covered this so many times. <laughs> Esther? Well, why was Esther a problem? No name of God. What's another book? Ezekiel. Why is Ezekiel a problem? That, that first chapter there, wheels and of wheels and fires and firmaments and glories and rainbows and chariots and eyes and living creatures and things. What was another book problem? Why Ecclesiastes? Negative. Negative. Pessimism. Says that there's nothing good in the world. Everything happens by chance and everything happens, you know, it's just fate whether it happens or whether it doesn't. What was another book? What? The song? What's wrong with the song? Carnal. Carnal. <laughs> well, what else would be included there? What have we left out? Oh, I remember. Proverbs. Proverbs, Proverbs says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Then the next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly. So it was mutually self-contradictory. So they said, well, what are we going to do with this? Well, the point is they went ahead and, and included all of those. Unlike what you'll find, like in Oxford's Dictionary of Church History, that wasn't when everything was finalized, been finalized for 500 years by the time Jamnia comes on the scene. But it's interesting that they did discuss five books, and it is also interesting that they did not discuss any of the Apocrypha. The records that we have of what happened at Jamnia do not tell us a thing about them saying, well, what about Bell and the Dragon? That's, I like that story. That's interesting. What about that book? Or Ecclesiasticus is so filled with wise, pithy sayings. Why not go ahead and include that? It's never brought up. In other words, the assumption is it's as though it was not even a question to consider. Can we include the Apocrypha? Or should the Apocrypha be included? It wasn't even a question to consider because they were considering important questions about five Old Testament canonical books. And never once considering anything about the Apocrypha. Now there are three Jewish authorities and they really say a lot. We're talking about first century AD. Remember what we've discussed before. You're going to have to be putting together a lot of pieces of the puzzle in your mind tonight as we work along. Now the two canon theory that really the Apocrypha was in the LXX way back in 250 or at least in 100 BC. And it was even in the Palestinian Jewish canon until the Pharisees had this Council of Jam and they took it out of there and we end up with our broad canon of Hellenism down in Alexandria and our narrow canon of Judaism in Palestine. Well, we're talking now about two cases, Josephus and Jamni in Palestine and one case, Philo, in Egypt and they're all agreeing. And there's not even a hint, not even a hint in books. If you write a book on canonicity today, you have to at least discuss the Apocrypha because it's something that is to be discussed today, not even mentioned there. As though it was not even a possible, at the furthest extent of someone's imagination, option to include something from the Apocrypha. So don't forget that. These people that say the Apocrypha is supposed to be in there like the Catholics do. And they try to rearrange things with church writers, but really we have to believe what the Jewish writers had to say before the church writers. The church ones are the ones who got mixed up later on. Remember, it is LXX manuscripts that were written by Christian scribes that have the Apocrypha, not those that were written by Jewish scribes that came earlier. The Jews had been trained. You don't take away from this word. You don't add to this word. They'd been trained from that from the very beginning for thousands of years. 
You say, well, didn't the Christians know that from Revelation? Well, yeah, but that had only been a short period of time, like a hundred years. The Jews had been trained for thousands of years, this is the sacred word of God. You don't add to it, you don't subtract from it. And the Christians should have learned a lesson from that. And that's what we're trying to do is take a lesson from that. We have to base our beliefs not on what some mixed up church writers thought because they got a hold of some wrong manuscripts and they didn't know enough of the history and the language behind them to ascertain what's canonical and what's not or what should be quoted from and what not, but the Jewish writers who knew what they were talking about. Okay, at this point we're going to begin getting into Christian writers. And before we get into that, we'll keep on enumerating them with starting with four heading on through in a moment but before doing that we have to have a little interlude here of three important points of development to remember in order to correctly understand the statements that they make and and these three points are very important three points of development to remember in order to correctly understand the statements that we're going to read, some of which we're going to read from the early Christian writers. Okay, in the first place, we have to remember that the terms canonical and apocryphal, or canon and apocrypha, are sometimes in the early years used in a wider and looser sense than they are today. Here's what I mean by that. Let's take both of these words and say a thing or two about both of these words. First of all, canonical. There were no studies, dear friends, in the first century or so. There were no studies in theology, textbooks on canonicity. Uh, they, they had no formal theology. They had no formal studies of these things. To them, the idea of canonicity was not as widespread or as important as, as it is today. They did not have the Roman Catholic system with which to contend, like Protestantism has today. And even if they had had Roman Catholicism or some other group that believed in a different canon, uh, they just did not have the theological writings and in many cases the theological expertise that people have today that is available in the church today. In other words, what I mean by that is because they didn't have these deep theological studies of canonicity and the inspiration of scriptures and the authority of scriptures and so forth, they would use on many occasions the term canonical in a much wider and looser sense than we do today. And they would say that such and such book is canonical and it might be one of the apocryphal books. So you have to understand what they mean by the terms. Now if we said that today, well that's heresy to say that. But they did not think in the first century, in the second century, and for a while after that, as strictly this is the canon. Now there was a term that was used there, but the term even itself, canon, if you remember that, was not used until some time later. Then in the second place, we're still under the same first point of development though, the word apocryphal. Now this goes back, all the way back to the first message that we did in studying the Apocrypha, where we did a study of the history of the origin and the development of the word Apocrypha. Ever since the time of Jerome, and particularly since the impetus that was given through the writings of the Reformers, the term Apocrypha has a very naughty, naughty, bad, bad connotation to it as being something spurious, something non-canonical, uh, something that's fallacious. That's the way we use the term today, apocrypha, the apocrypha, or the apocryphal books, because they're spurious, they're fallacious, and they're non-canonical. In other words, it's just the opposite of our conception of something being canonical. That didn't come about until at least the time of Jerome. Before then, some of the church writers I know I'm giving you a lot, but we're not even halfway through tonight. We're probably only a 
sixth of the way or fifth of the way through or something. The, some of the early church writers would use this term apocrypha or apocryphal to speak of writings that were apocalyptic in nature and or esoteric in nature. And we discussed the dual concepts of exoteric and esoteric back in that first message. Exoteric were books that were open for the general public. E-X-O-T-E-R-I-C, exoteric. Esoteric, E-S-O-T-E-R-I-C, esoteric, were hidden books. Remember the account in, what is it, Second Estrus of Ezra being commanded to write the 94 books? Make seven, make 24 of them exoteric. Make 70 of them esoteric. If you remember the account, that essentially, we're using the technical terms, but that essentially was what was being said then. 24 were exoteric. What were those? We're all 24 of the Old Testament, which is interesting. That's found right in the Apocrypha. Says there's only 24 books that are made for everyone. But then what about some high elite group of people, the spiritually wise, the deep ones? Well, there are 70 esoteric books that are hidden, that are reserved only for them. What Ezra had in mind, or the writer of uh, Second Esther, pseudo Ezra had in mind by those 70, we don't know. But we've got a good guess as far as maybe that including some of the Apocrypha and maybe including some of the Pseudepigrapha, just that terms have changed between then and now. The Revelation of John, what we call Revelation, was called an Apocryphal book by some of the writers. For the continuation of John, what we call Revelation was called an Apocryphal book by some of the writers. They did not mean non-canonical. They did not mean spurious. They did not mean fallacious. They meant apocalyptic. It's an apocalyptic book. And they could have even meant esoteric by that, that something's mysterious about this book. The common man can't just pick up the book of Revelation and understand it like he can pick up the book of Philippians and understand what's written in the book of Philippians. I don't really like those terms, esoteric and exoteric, because it, it fosters a false notion but that could have been the concept in some of the writers' minds whenever they would attach the adjective apocryphal to a book like the Revelation of the Apostle John, that it was both apocalyptic and esoteric or apocalyptic or esoteric, one or the other. Okay, do you understand why I'm giving you all this? In other words, whenever we start discussing some of these writers, just because they say such and such is said in the canonical book of Bell and Dragon. That does not mean they had the same concept that we have today. Amen. You have to understand that. Or you just read that like the Catholics do and say, see, 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 they said it's canonical. That means they believed it was divinely inspired scripture. No, not necessarily. They used it in a wider, broader, looser sense of just being religious material that's included there. Okay, another point to remember. These are points of development. First of all, we discuss the development of these terms. That concerns the LXX. The LXX from at least the 4th century and evidently even earlier than that from some of the writings we have of these church writers included some but not all and not consistently the same of book, books of the Apocrypha. Not only did the LXX begin in later Christian manuscripts to include books of the Apocrypha, but it introduced a new arrangement of the Old Testament. It introduced a new arrangement of the Old Testament that's comparable to the present day English arrangement, which I'll give to you here in a moment. But if they're introducing a new arrangement, what was the old? The law, the prophets, and the writings. That was the division, not only the division, that's the way that manuscripts were set up, not the scrolls, because you couldn't have all of them there, but when you came to the codex and you had codices available, and you had, let's say, the whole Old Testament, then you'd have the five books of the law, then you'd have the 13 or however many, the eight or however many you want to make of the prophets, but they would come next, 
then whatever you thought in your division as writings or hymns or precepts for the conduct of our human and moral life, those would come at the end. The English Bible, as you well know, doesn't have things divided like that. The English division goes basically like this, and it's based upon the LXX. It starts with the law, then it gives us the historical prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. This is the way our English Bible is set up. Then it gives us the poetry and the didactic material. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the song. You see those are right in order. This is the way your English Bible is set up. The law, then the historical books, historical prophets, then the poetic and didactic books, and then finally the prophets, the writing prophets. And essentially, that's the way our Bible is set up, based on the setup of the LXX. Now, because the LXX and later manuscripts had some books of the Apocrypha, then that has caused some people to jump to the conclusion of two canons, a broad one down in Egypt, a narrow one in Jerusalem. But let me give you one more point about that that really, I guess, is a capstone to this whole discussion of the two-canon theory that we've been on and off and on and off for the last few weeks discussing, and that concerns the writings of Philo. Philo was the most learned Jewish Hellenist in Alexandria of his day, maybe of his century. Notice what I said, Jewish Hellenist. Philo most definitely was imbued with Hellenistic thought. Now, the whole claim of these people, including the Catholics who hold to this two-canon theory, is that this philosophy and spirit of Hellenism in Alexandria is what weakened the former Judaistic beliefs of a narrow canon and caused them to expand their view, open up the canon, and accept books of the Apocrypha in. Well, we've shown you other ways how that just doesn't work itself out in any form or fashion or by the stretch of anyone's imagination in history and I don't guess there's any better proof of that than the man in the writings of Philo. We're talking about someone who lives just before and during the time and after the time of Christ. He just his life is right during the time when Jesus lives and he's in Alexandria and he is the most learned Jewish Hellenist there. Now if he's a Hellenist and all the other Hellenists there are accepting the broad canon of Hellenism in Alexandria, then obviously so would Philo. He's the number one of the Hellenists of the Jews in Alexandria. But yet why is it when he gives us our division, he gives us threefold, no mention of the Apocrypha at all. When he quotes books from the Old Testament, he does just that. He quotes Old Testament books and never books from the Apocrypha. Now, I don't think... There's any way that can be explained if there at that time was a broad canon down in Alexandria. I don't think there's any way you could explain how this broad canon notion escaped the eyes and the writings of Philo. He was the number one Jewish Hellenist there. So it simply would have been impossible for him to escape that. We mentioned this point again, although we've covered it before, concerning the LXX, including the Apocrypha, because it's going to come up here again later on. As a matter of fact, we bring it right up in the next point. Let's come to the third point here under these points of development before we get into Christian writers. Slow me down or put a cold stop to me if you have to, if I've left something out or you left something out. I don't think I have. Maybe you have. The third point, from the early to the mid-2nd century A.D., we have a very important development that takes place. Uh, and let me, let me preface my remarks with a question I'll address to you. Uh, our concern right now in discussing the Apocrypha is the place that it has in Roman Catholicism. And before the Apocrypha could be accepted by the Roman Catholic Church, although don't misunderstand me, there was no such thing as Roman Catholic Church during this period of time that comes later, but uh, 
Would you stay with me for a moment? Before the Apocrypha could be accepted by the Roman Catholic Church, it had to be in the official language of Roman Catholicism, which was what? Latin. That leads me into this third point. The old Latin version comes about somewhere in the first half of the second century AD. We'll discuss this later when we discuss versions and translations. Remember what we're in, biblical literature, but remember what the title of the class is, Introduction to Biblical Literature. So only, we're only introducing you to these things. You could spend time and time and more time on each one of these topics. Just introducing you to it. The Old Latin Version, that's the name of it, capital letters, O and capital letter L. The Old Latin Version came about in the second century, and it too contained some of the books of the Apocrypha. And that is due to the fact that evidently the Old Latin Bible, this was a harbinger to the Vulgate, but the Old Latin version had a harbinger itself, and that was none else but the LXX. Consequently, if you're making translation from Greek to Latin, from LXX to Old Latin, and your harbinger, the LXX, contains books of the Apocrypha, then it's no surprising thing to see that the same will be found in the Old Latin version, namely various books of the Apocrypha. Therefore, it's no surprise to us when we see some of the early church fathers, and this is what we're going to be getting into here in just a moment, some of the early church fathers who, A, either had no knowledge of Hebrew as the language, or B, no knowledge of the canonical history of Jewry, or C, both of the above, it's no surprise to see them freely quote from the apocryphal books they had before them because they would have either the LXX as manuscript before them or the old Latin version. And particularly those in the Western sphere of Christendom, what we call the Western church of that period, would have the old Latin version before them. Not the LXX because they didn't speak Greek, they spoke Latin after we move a few centuries from the time of the Apostle John. Okay, you get all that. It's no surprise, I said, to see that some of the early church writers are quoting from the Apocrypha because they either, A, have no knowledge of the Hebrew language, therefore they can't trace back to find the root of these things, or B, no knowledge of the canonical history of Jewry. They don't know. They have not researched firsthand or have not read others' research into the canonical history of the Jewish people, what they counted, what they considered to be canonical, or see both of the above, and I guess generally it'd be both and not one or the other. The writer would have neither a knowledge of Hebrew nor a knowledge of the canonical history of Jewry. So there are a few early writers, not very many, but there are a few most notably Jerome, who knew the Hebrew language. And there were a few, not very many, but most notably, as far as an early one would be considered, Melito, Bishop of Sardis, in one, around 170 A.D., who had a knowledge of the canonical history of the Jews, then they're not going to be nearly so free or careless in their use of the term canonical or apocrypha or in their references to the Old Testament versus the apocrypha. Now that's very important, so be sure you have this down. That's very important because we're going to see distinctions among some of these writers. Those writers, let me sum it up a different way if that's too difficult to write. Those writers who had either A, a knowledge of Hebrew, or B, who had researched firsthand the canonical history of the Jews, or C, both of the above, the writers who were qualified in those areas do not make the careless allusions to the Apocrypha like some of the other writers do. In other words, what I'm trying to say by all of this is it can be explained why some of the writers, such as Tertullian, why some of the early writers do make many, many, many references to the Apocrypha. Number one, they weren't trained in Hebrew. 
So all they had before them were LXX manuscripts, or uh, if we move a few years later after that, old Latin manuscripts. So if the LXX, and that's why it's so important that you know what you should know by now about the LXX containing some of the books of the Apocrypha. So whenever they're reading along in the LXX, and they're reading along in old Latin version, and they've read along in that all their life, and they don't know Hebrew, then since this is the Bible to them, then the Bible to them is whatever is from page one to page a thousand or whatever, the last page, the Bible's in between that. And sad to say, sometimes in between those pages would be apocryphal books. But because they were not trained or skilled in Hebrew, they couldn't research it. They couldn't, in other words, go to Israel and say, well, let's pick up some Jewish writings and find out. Jews were writing in Hebrew. The scholars were still writing in Hebrew. So in other words, you're dependent on someone else's translation which is the exact same problem that people have run into from day one until now, which is the exact same problem we have today, being dependent on other people's translations. You know English, but you don't know Hebrew. So you end up, has it ever happened to anyone here? Well, I've changed some verses for you, with a false notion about something. Why? You weren't trained in Hebrew and you weren't trained in Greek. All you knew was the Bible you had before you. And as far as you knew, everything from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 was the inspired word of God. That's right. <laughs> Even though 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20 is not supposed to be there, you see. A Romans 1, a Romans 8-1 is not supposed to be there, you see. As far as you know, it's supposed to be there. How, how can you, how can we charge you? We're not, we're not, you see, we couldn't come along later in history and say, there's someone who believed in the Apocrypha. No, in the honesty and integrity of your heart, you quote 1 Corinthians 6.20 because it's in your Bible. You don't know any better right. not to quote that. Okay, do you see the analogy I'm making? Amen. We're going to read early church writers who they didn't know any better. Their Bible that they had being LXX or Old Latin contained books of the Apocrypha. So how can you really hold them accountable except say naughty naughty if you're a scholar you should have known Hebrew. But how can you really hold them accountable if they're going to quote from that? And, and, and we can go a step further. Did they think that was on par with the other writings in that book? Well, go back to the end of the analogy. Did you think that 1 Corinthians 6.20 was on par with 1 Corinthians 6.19? Well, certainly. You thought it was on par. It's, it's the same word. It's the same spirit that inspired all that. That's the problem you run into, you see, when you don't know the languages. You're so dependent on the translation you have before you. Whatever language that it's in, you're just so greatly dependent upon that that you're going to run into problems sooner or later. Praise God, we as Protestants don't have whole false books in our Bible, but the Catholics do. And the Catholics base everything so much on Latin and not on Hebrew that they just trace back, 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 and as far as you can go, it's not the Vulgate, but the harbinger to the Vulgate, which is the old Latin version. So you could say, well, just for the average Catholic, could you blame them? It's in their Bible. How do they know? They can't read Hebrew. Oh, they can't even read Latin, the average person, but assuming that they could. Let's check the sources then. Okay, we'll go way back to the Vulgate. We'll go way back to old Latin manuscripts or allusions from uh, writers past that time to old Latin manuscripts. And what do you have? Well, there's the Apocrypha. Apocrypha is supposed to be part of our Bible. Or the Deuterocanonical books are supposed to be part of our Bible. So how could you hold them guilty? Very interesting point. That's why I give you this before we get into it. So you won't be confused. Hopefully you're not now. Now the Eastern Church, another point still under this. <clears throat> the Eastern Church follows, well, early men like Melito, or let's say followed, past tense, because I think in one of the consuls, 672 or something, don't quote me on that, but one of the consuls, the consul of Jerusalem, and I think 672, they have some changes, but we'll come to that later as well. The Eastern Greek Church, which was just that, a Greek church, and it's still referred to today as the Eastern Greek Orthodox Church. The Eastern Church followed people like Melito for, oh, about a thousand years. In other words, they didn't hold to the apocryphal books. The Western Church, however, was not only Western, but it's also referred to as the Latin Church, followed 
the teachings of, well, among others, people like Tertullian. And most notably, Augustine, who was a Western church writer, not an Eastern church writer. They were, Tertullian and Augustine were Western Latin church writers. They wrote in Latin, not in Greek. And so now you understand this distinction you have to make between this Greek language and Latin language, and that's what is getting people into trouble. Okay, do you have all of that? Then we're really going to get into all the statistics now. This brings us in to number four, Philo, Josephus, Jamnia, now getting into the Christian realm. Number four, Clement of Rome. First of all, we'll deal with what are generally referred to as the Apostolic Fathers. They're referred to as the Apostolic Fathers. Clement of Rome wrote an epistle to the Corinthians. Uh, let me give you a date, A.D. 100. Supposedly, Clement of Rome was, was a disciple of the Apostles. Living at a time like that, uh, well, times overlap. I don't mean he was born in AD 100. This is around when he's writing. So obviously his time overlaps the Apostle John and, and maybe other apostles. And probably most of you here in the, in the little book, uh, Apostolic Fathers, and I know a lot of you obtained several years ago, you might have read uh, the epistle of Clement. Uh, there's there's a so-called second epistle that's really a spurious epistle. The first one is the reliable one, the first epistle of Clement of Rome to the Corinthians. And statistically wise, let me give you what we have from the readings that I've been able to, what I've been able to deduce. Wisdom, I'm going to give you the places in the Apocrypha that, that he is alluding to. Wisdom uh, 2.24. If you do have your Apocrypha, why don't you open up to that? Wisdom 2.24. Some of these we're going to read. Um, many of them we'll skip over because it would just take up so much time. Some of these verses you may remember. Some of these I can just remember off the cuff what they're talking about. That's towards the end of the chapter, if I'm not mistaken, in Wisdom. And it's talking about the devil... Uh, by spite, bringing death into the world, I believe is what it has to say. Okay, in the third chapter of the first epistle of Clement, let me find a good place to pick up reading, and you kind of go over Wisdom 2.24 and see if you don't hear something that sounds the same. For this reason, unrighteousness and peace are now far departed from you, inasmuch as everyone abandons the fear of God and has become blind in his faith neither walks in the ordinances of his appointment, nor acts a part becoming a Christian. Okay, now listen to this phrase. But walks after his own wicked lusts, which evidently is what the writer of wisdom means by the word spite there, that the devil was spiteful towards God because of God's position. He was lusting after the, the power that God had, and according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, he fell by pride but walks after his own wicked lusts, resuming the practice of an unrighteous and ungodly envy by which death itself entered into the world. You'll find that little phrase there, by which death itself entered into the world, that the devil, by his lust, by his spite, by his envy, brought death into the world. So, there is one reference. Uh, another one, Wisdom 11.22. Wisdom of Solomon, Pseudo-Solomon, 11.22 and 12.12. 12. Now, according to those, the, um, the compilers of the works here, if you've got, by the way, what Antonicene Fathers, that's what I'm getting this out of, Antonicene Fathers, then some of the references are given, although not all of them, and although uh, not all of them are reliable, at least they're given. I think we dealt with that. Has someone read those verses? Does that, does that deal with the, uh, about questioning God and his power? 
Wisdom 11, 22, and 12, 12. Wasn't that the, one of the first ones we dealt with when we discussed how it compared to the New Testament? And, and we looked at Romans. Do I have to look it up? Can someone tell me? Is that right? Okay, here's, here's what he has here. This is in uh, chapter 27. Really, it's not chapters or paragraphs, but they're called chapters here in Antinocene Fathers. But, but the 27th paragraph in Clement. By the word of his mind, he established all things, and by his word, he can overthrow them. And this is in quotation marks. Who shall say unto him, What hast thou done? Or who shall resist the power of his strength? And then the reference is given back to wisdom. Well, we could say maybe he's referring back to uh, the book of Romans because a similar phrase is found in the book of Romans from the writings of the Apostle Paul. So that's given, although that's not as definite. Then another reference, Judith 8, 19. And we won't look that up, but then Judith, another one, it's really not a verse. They give, you, they give us Judith 8, 30. But it really concerns, I think, like all of, all of chapter 8 and all of chapter 9. He's not giving us a quote here, but he's telling us the account whenever uh, their, their city was being besieged by Holofernes, remember, and, and Judith went before the elders of the city and said, I've got a plan that I'm going to, I'll be famous for all generations after this if you let me do this plan, but don't ask me what it is. And so they let her do the plan. Well, here in, uh, what, paragraph... 55. Many women also being strengthened. Now, this is Clement. Keep in focus what we're talking about. 100 AD, right after the time of John, Clement of Rome. Many women also having strengthened, being strengthened by the grace of God, having, perform, having performed numerous manly exploits, the blessed Judith, he calls her the blessed Judith, when her city was besieged, asked of the elders permission to go forth into the camp of the strangers and exposing herself to danger, she went out for the love which she bare to her country and people, then besieged, and the Lord delivered Holofernes into the hands of a woman. Now there is a very definite, he calls her by name, Judith. The blessed Judith did this. Well, we're not going to take the time to comment on all of these, but you see a reference like that, he's not quoting that as scripture. He obviously, what's interesting is that he obviously was familiar with the book of Judith. I mean, very familiar. How could it just pop to his mind how this had happened? As a matter of fact, he unites Esther and Judith as being two famous women in ancient Israel. Well, to say the least, Clement of Rome was not a Hebrew scholar. So you see, he fails in one of those tests. Well, he fails in both of them. He also was not a student of the canonical history of the Jewish people. Okay, moving along, number five, still under Apostolic Fathers, the Epistle of Barnabas, around the same date. Just giving you general dates here, the Epistle of Barnabas. Uh, you could say Epistle of, epistle of Pseudo-Barnabas, obviously not the same as Paul's Apostolic Companion. I've not been able to find any references in Barnabas to the Apocrypha, so you can put none or zero beside Barnabas. Another apostolic father, I call them that only because that's what they're generally known as. We don't call them fathers because Jesus said don't call any man your father, but that's what they're referred to as. Ignatius, Ignatius, who wrote various epistles, epistles to the Ephesians, around 115 A.D., in his Epistle to the Magnesians, one of the cities in Asia, the Epistle to the Magnesians, chapter 3, he has a reference to the 13th chapter of Daniel. Well, you say Daniel only has 12. Well, not according to the Apocrypha. It's got a 13th that has the history of Susanna, and it has a 14th, the history of the destruction of Bel and the Dragon. So you don't need to look anything up, but listen to this quotation. For Daniel the wise, at 12 years of age, became possessed of the divine spirit and convicted the elders who in vain carried their gray heads of being false accusers of lusting after the beauty of another man's wife. It's a whole account there 
in the 13th chapter of Daniel about the history of Susanna. Did you know that Daniel was 12 whenever he did that? See, we don't know where he got these notions that Daniel was 12. Daniel certainly wasn't 12 then. So there is one reference in Ignatius' writings to the Apocrypha. He says Daniel did all of this possessed by the divine spirit. So it's as though he believes this is canonical, that Daniel possessed by the divine spirit did this deed on behalf of Susanna for these two reprobates that were trying to seduce her. Then number seven, Polycarp. Polycarp, A.D. 150. No references that I could find. Another that comes in the apostolic writing period, the shepherd of Hermas, the writings of Hermas, H-E-R-M-A-S, around A.D. 150 as well. No references that I can find. Number nine, the same period of time, Justin Martyr, so-called because that's what happened to him, 150 A.D., quotes freely from the Old Testament, but no references to the Apocrypha. And then really moving beyond now the apostolic period of the apostolic fathers, getting into the early church writers. Number 10, Irenaeus, I-R-E-N-A-E-U-S. Irenaeus has two references, Wisdom 9, 13 to 17, Wisdom 9, 13 to 17, and Daniel chapter 13 again. Uh, I think particularly he has reference to verse 56. Why don't you turn to the first of those, and I guess we'll do the second as well. The first of those, Wisdom 9, 13 to 17, uh, that's a passage that is talking about I uh, think origin of the soul or the state of the soul being imprisoned in the man's body and all the you have to really read the whole passage verses 13 through 17 before you kind of find what I'm going to read here at, in a moment in the midst of that this is in Irenaeus he wrote one famous book called against heresies this is in chapter 18 paragraph 9, or it's chapter 28, excuse me, chapter 28, paragraph 9. This message will be continued.